Thank you for joining us, those of you here in person, those of you that are joining us from church at home. Man, we are just thrilled to have you today. So grab your devices, your Bibles. Today we're going to talk from the book of Romans. You say, Mark, today is about Advent. We've been talking from Romans forever. So why are you going to the book of Romans? Because Romans has this amazing text in Romans chapter 15 and verse 13 about hope. And we're going to talk about hope this week and joy the next week. And we're going to talk about love the week after. So I want to go there in a moment. But I want to say a few things. First of all, I want to say thank you to the probably hundreds of cumulative hours that have been placed in the renovation of our stage this week. And so you notice things look different up here, don't they? They look very different. This is the size TV that every person needs in their home. Isn't that right? Yes. Yes. Well, you won't have eyes long after you look at that thing that big. But we want to say thank you for all of those that placed about all the hours in to take down what the stage used to look like and to transform it into what it is today. And so thank you so much. Yes, they did a great job, didn't they? Outstanding job. Outstanding. And uh, so let me talk to you for a few moments about Advent. We, we use that word around here a lot. Advent, the word means arrival. And, and when we use the word Advent and arrival, what we think about is the arrival of Christ, the incarnate Christ, and, and that is absolutely part of Advent. But also Advent has two parts to it. Not only is it a celebration of that, of the coming of the incarnate Christ, but it is also an anticipation about what is to come. And what is to come is that of Jesus the King when he returns at the second advent. So there are two parts of that. And so I thought about this word expectation as being that second part of advent. Because this season is all about expectation. Now at our house we have this tradition. And this tradition is that on Christmas Eve we open one gift. Now let me ask you for a moment. How many of you in your home have that tradition also that on Christmas Eve you open one gift? Let me see your hand. Anybody in here? Okay. You need to start it because it's a lot of fun, right? So what we give out to all of our family on Christmas Eve is pajamas. That's, they know that's what they're going to get. Two reasons. One is that we want some symmetry on Christmas morning when we take pictures, right? We kind of want to look like we're all together. Secondly is that you can't wear those ratty old pajamas that you've been wearing like for 10 years that has a hole right here in the back side of it, right? You can't wear that, so we do that. So what we, think, what we realized when our kids were smaller is that we call that like an anticipation gift is what it was. It was an anticipation gift. It was about simply hope in what was going to happen in a few hours the next morning. So I had this thought, right? So what if you open that gift on Christmas Eve? If it's an anticipation gift about what's going to happen the next morning. Suppose it's kind of a gift that is a real letdown, right? Suppose that it's a pair of socks. What every kid wants is a pair of socks. Suppose it's that. And so what happens is that that sort of sets the stage for what they think is going to happen in a few hours the next morning. It is. So they place their hope in that. And when that hope in that gift doesn't meet their expectation, then it somewhat dashes their hope for what's going to happen in a few hours the next morning on Christmas morning. You say, Mark, why do you tell us that story? Because it's a lot like how when you and I live. We live like that with this thing of hope and expectation within our lives. We do. That we place our hope, well, I would call it misplaced hope. We place our hope in so many things that cannot bear under the weight of the expectation of our lives. And when it fails us, we wonder what happened or why did it fail us? Or, or why in the world would that you know, not work out for me? And because the reality is that most of them, those expectations cannot bear the weight of our own life. So we want to talk about hope because we have this tendency as human beings to misplace hope our hope, to place it in situations and circumstances and people that are going to ultimately disappoint us. So I brought a little illustration for you this morning. Let me set it up for you in a moment. So here's the thing, the sponge and the water. <laughs> Did you see that? That would have been bad. That would have been really bad. We were joking with all the, um, the, uh, the, the worship team this morning that somebody bringing this out was Allison, was afraid she's going to trip and drop it. Well, I almost just did that before you. So here's the thing. This sponge is you. You say, thank you, Mark. That's really a great thing for you to refer to me as. Now, this sponge is you. And so what happens is that this sponge is full of water. And, and you know, we all have hope. Here's the thing. We all have hope in something. And you say, well, I am absolutely hopeless. But you're probably, if you really look at your life, you're hoping in something. 
And, and it may not always be the right thing, right? It all, may not always be the most um, um, solid thing to hope for in life, but we all hope in something. So let's say that you're hoping in a relationship. Because, hey, you know, we are built to, to live in community, so you're hoping in a relationship. So you have that hope in your life. And I'm going to let that hope kind of drip out for a moment because the water represents hope this morning. And so you place all your hope in that relationship is what you do. And so what happens in that relationship? Because we have our hope in life, we, it has this proclivity in life to simply escape us at times. So you place your hope in this relationship and all of a sudden that person is unfaithful to you or they harm you or they offend you. And so what happens is this, your hope begins to erode is what it does. Yes, so some of you have hope in your profession, right? You have your hope in profession. You went to school, you studied, you did well, and so now you have this job or your vocation, and you think, well, that job is gonna last forever and nothing is gonna ever change, and you walk in one day and all of a sudden your boss says, we don't, we don't need you anymore, right? And so the hope escapes you, it does. We place our hope in so many things in life that cannot hold our hope. So what can hold our hope? That's a huge question. I think that's a big question for you and I today as we talk about hope together for a few moments, that what can hold our hope in life? Because we're always hoping in something. Yes, last week or the week before, you were hoping that the weather would sort of feel like winter time. Isn't that right? And now you got up this morning and what are you hoping? You're hoping that the weather would start feeling like summertime again. Isn't that right? Because you can't be pleased. So we're all hoping in something in life. Some of you are hoping as Christmas gets a little closer that your in-laws, when they show up, they're not going to stay as long as they did last year with you, right? And so you're hoping in that. You're hoping that you're going to lose some of the poundage that you're going to put on celebrating during this Advent season that we hope all the time. Hope is a good thing. Understand that. This illustration, us talking about this morning, is not saying to you, hey, I'm just not going to ever hope in anything else because it all disappoints me at some time in life. That's not the point of our conversation. Hope is a good thing. But I have to also say to you is this, hope is not an easy thing. And I think you need to realize that, that hope is not an easy thing. Well, what do you mean? When I read the Advent story, what I realize that hope comes into this world as we celebrate Advent and the coming of the incarnate Christ, hope comes into this world in a very hard way. Let me explain to you, remind you about the Advent story. You have a carpenter and a peasant girl who are engaged. She becomes pregnant by the Holy Spirit. That is problematic, is it not? That is really problematic. Yes, that is detrimental to anybody's engagement. It is. And then Joseph, who simply the carpenter, he entertains divorce he travels to Bethlehem. They find lodging in a cave. You know, they're visited by shepherds. So why should you and I think it's any different within our lives in the way that hope enters our lives? Hope is not an easy thing. I think that's what we have to, where we have to start. We have to agree on that fact that hope is not an easy thing within our lives. No, but what I understand when I read the Advent story, what I realize that God uses kingdoms and God uses kings and God uses hardships and struggles and God uses bad times within their lives and the character of the Advent narrative to simply birth greater hope. That there's nothing surface about hope for you and I within our lives. It, it, there, it, it's the goal of everything, even the struggle of my life, even the struggle of your life, the goal of all of those things is simply hope. So whom do we hope in? Who do we hope in? What I realize, there's two types of hopes in life. There's this general hope that we have, and nothing is wrong with having hope in your life. We have hope in relationships. We have hope in, you know, in, in things that uh, we surround ourselves with. There's nothing wrong within itself to have hope in things. There's not. But then there's also, there's ultimate hope. There's general hope and there is ultimate hope within our lives. So, so I thought, well, what does that really look like for us? Well, we are find ourselves in this 
uh, coronavirus pandemic. Say, Mark, you didn't have to bring that up on a Sunday morning. I, I should bring that up because that's the reality of our culture right now. It's the reason why some of you are watching from church at home today and you're not here in person. And, and we absolutely understand that. It's the reason that you wore masks when you came in and you took them off when you got to your seat or you're still wearing them. We, I understand that. So here's my hope. I hope in a vaccine. Why? Because I'm tired. I am tired of people suffering. I am. And I am tired of, well, I just have to say this, that I am tired of actually conducting funeral services. And, and, and so I, I don't, I, because it really breaks my heart to see people suffer. So I'm hoping for a vaccine. That is a general hope in my life. My life is not built on that, but I hope for that. But I also realize it is God who gives the researchers and the scientists the ability to develop that vaccine for you and I. It is God's providence in all things so that all life is lived through the very hands of God because God is sovereign and God is providential. So that is ultimate hope. My general hope in that of a vaccine is going to lead me to God because it is God that provides the ability of these people to develop that. To That is ultimate hope. So my ultimate hope is in God. Because if it's just general hope alone, then at some point that hope becomes misplaced. That hope is placed in something that can fail me or disappoint me in life. Listen, the reality of where we are as believers is that some of us, even this morning, deal with feelings of hopelessness. And what I realize, Mark, I'm not sitting here absolutely hopeless. What I realize is there's different degrees of hopelessness within our lives. There, there are. Some of you are just dealing with this morning, and I shouldn't say are, as if somehow it is less than being hopeless, but you're dealing with, I believe, a diminished level of hope within your life today because of all the things that are going around in the world and what's happening in our current culture. It's not that you're doubting that God exists, but you're doubting where God is, and you're doubting if God is going to intervene on your behalf. Let me read a text to you from the book of Romans chapter 15. Here it is, Romans chapter 15 and verse 13. It says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that the power of the Holy Spirit, so, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. It's a short verse. Let me read it again. I want you to get all of this. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. So, what I realize is this. As we have been studying through the book of Romans, it's perfect for us to use for Advent this morning that all of a sudden, just before Paul ends his talk to us in Romans in chapter 16, he takes a moment to pause. He lays down his pen, he breathes very deep, and he says, here's a prayer that I want to pray for you. And he starts it out by simply saying this, may the God of hope. What is he saying to you and I? Here's what he's saying. That God is not just a God that gives out hope. That God is not just a God that simply is a source or supplier of hope. What he's saying to you and I is this. He takes us a level higher than that. Because that's what you and I need to be a firm foundation in our life. That God is not just the giver or the source or the supplier of hope. But simply that it is God's very nature. That he is simply the author of hope. It's not that he just gives it out. He's the, it's the essence of who he is. Hope is part of the character and the nature of of God. And because of that, then that makes it unchangeable. So that whatever takes place in my life, in your life, and the world around us does not affect God and his ability to give us hope in life. That's what he's saying to you and I. No matter what the news at six o'clock in the afternoon says to you, no matter what you read on social media, it, no, regardless of all of that, that it's God's power supersedes all of that because this is part of God's nature and character, that of hope. Let me share a text with you from the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 18. I love it because we're talking about this being the nature of God. We go to the book of Hebrews. Nobody knows who wrote the book of Hebrews. So we say that God wrote it. So here's the words that God is speaking to us today from Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 18. So that by two 
unchangeable things in which it is impossible, it is impossible for God to lie. It is impossible for God to lie. Now, let's take a little survey this morning for just a moment, okay? And here it is. You got to be honest. You're in church, okay? So you can't lie, right? How many of you in life, how many have ever told a lie? Raise your hand. Let me see your hand. How many ever, okay, good. I'm not looking around, okay? Because I don't want to see the ones lying. Put your hands down, right? We, we have all done that. Here's the thing. Here's what separates you and I from God, that we need something greater and outside of ourselves. It is impossible for God to lie. But you can't say that about all the places that you've placed your hope. You can't say that. Because you have placed your hope in things and people in certain situ- situations and they have failed you. So he says, impossible God to lie. We who have fled for refuge might, here's what he says, have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. Why do we have this strong encouragement to hold to that hope? Why? Because it's impossible for God to lie. It is absolutely impossible for God to lie. Look what he says. We have this, he takes it a step further, that we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of our soul. Hope is an anchor placed deep within our lives. And, it, and that hope that is an anchor only happens when that anchor is forged in the struggles of our life. That's what happens. Hope is a work that transcends just the visible aspects of our life. Yes, why? Because we tried tangible things and they don't fix us, right? We tried those. If I relocate, if I relocate maybe and get away from everything around me, then maybe I'll have more hope within my life. And what you realize is that you go with you, right? And that's many times our problem. Yes, if I just start a new life, then I'm going to have more hope. If I just have a different relationship with someone, then that's going to give me the hope that I need or more resources. Can I tell you, as the sponge taught us this morning, they can't hold your hope. They can't. They can't bear up under your expectations. They cannot because God is the only one that cannot lie. We have to have an anchor. We have to have something with weight and strength. We have to have the king within our lives who is not just the creator, but he's the sustainer of all of our lives. And you think, well, Mark, I'm really struggling with this idea of this whole hope thing forged in the struggle of my own life. And and I would say to you this then. At what point do you find yourself more desperate for God and hope in your life? At what point do you find yourself more desperate for hope in your life? Is it the points of your life when things are going well and things are going wonderful and all your way in life? Or is it the moments then when things are not going as planned? Hope is forged as an anchor in the struggles of my life. It takes me back to the Advent story. It takes me back to Joseph and Mary. It's not an easy road. The road to hope is not always an easy road. Let me read to you from the book of Matthew, chapter 1 and verse 18. It's about the birth of Christ. It says this, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed, promised, engaged to Joseph before they were together, before the marriage was consummated, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And this is not easy for Joseph. Put yourself there. We talked about that before. Put yourself at that moment. You're engaged. You're about to be married. Then your soon-to-be wife comes to you, says, sit down. Have a cup of coffee with me. I have something to share with you, right? Yes. And, and so they kind of build up the conversation. How was your day? How was things at work? How did you, how that new table you're building go? How, how, did, how did the new power tool that I bought you, how did that all work out? Oh, by the way, I'm pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And then you go, you know, you kind of inject that in the conversation. It's, it's a tough thing for Joseph to deal with. Well, you can't take the humanity out of the narrative. You can't. And the scripture says, here's his response. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame. And when I read that, I thought, what does that mean? It means that he has the lawful ability 
to simply cast her out into the street and she would become homeless and hopeless. And most of the time when this would happen in the life of a woman, the woman would have to result to prostitution for her to actually make a living or to feed herself. And, and so she would be put to shame or he even had the ability by law to put her to death. But he resolved to divorce her quietly. You see, here's the thought. The ways for hope in my life and your life are not always immediately visible. They're not always right there before us you know, in, in the circumstances of our life. It, it, they're not always, and I wrote a word, two words down. It's a great southern term. It's called smack dab. Have you ever heard the term smack dab? Have you? Yes, right? Yeah, some smack dab right in front of you, right? Yes, my dad used to say that. He would send me to get something, and I couldn't find it, and he would go in there and say, look, it's smack dab right in front of your face. Or he'd always say what? If it was a snake, it would have bitten you. I don't know why we come up with those terms. I have no idea. But yet, it's not always that of hope is right out in front of us, and we don't always see that. So here's what happens with Joseph. There are times in your life and my life that we even have to sleep on it. What does Joseph do? He goes to sleep. He has a dream. Matthew chapter 1 records that. And it says an angel of the Lord comes. He commands Joseph to take his wife. And what does Joseph do? Joseph goes and he takes Mary as his wife. Understand that. Hope is ours when we acknowledge it. It takes this personal initiative. Hope is forged in the very tough times of my life and your life. It's not necessarily that we can bring you up here in, you know, on, a, on a Sunday morning. We can pray over you and we can maybe lay hands upon you and you're going to leave just full of hope and the whole world is going to be totally different in the way you see it. That's not hope is being forged in the struggle of your life today. Because you're reaching out to Christ, you're leaning into him, and he's the source. In fact, more than the source, he's the essence of it. It's his very character and nature and that of hope. Hebrews chapter 11 also says in verse 1, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That hope is founded on our faith. It's faith in something outside of ourselves. That's why there's a difference between that of general hope and that of ultimate hope. General hope is that of faith in people and things around us and science and the ability of, of people. But what I realize is this, that I can have general hope in this life, but it always has to take me the ultimate hope, and that is it is God who sustains me with hope in this world. Because our hope is based upon promises, not probabilities in this life. It is. So when I look at this Advent story, what I realize is this. Joseph, he's struggling. And, and, I, and I thought about this. as we, He's struggling. God initiates. God sends an angel to speak to him and said, hey, Joseph, here is the thing. What Mary said to you is absolutely true, I, I, I guess. And so he, here is what you have to do. Here's what you need to do. Joseph responds in faith. And when Joseph responds in faith to the struggle that he's facing in life, hope is gained within his life. Hope is gained within his life. And if hope is found in faith, then the opposite of hope has to be doubt. And I know that's where some of us struggle this morning. And what I realize, it always takes me back to that thought we find in the New Testament when, when the, the man with the, um, with the demon-possessed son comes to Christ and he simply says, Lord, help me with my unbelief because even in the middle of my doubt, I can have hope. Because that's the way God works with our lives. And then he goes on to say, may the God of hope fill you. He is the author, the source, the, the origin of it. May it fill you. And, and here's what I say about that when I read through this text this week over and over. It's God's will. It's God's heart. It's God's desire for you to be filled with hope. Even in the middle of what seems to be hopeless, he wants to fill you with that ultimate hope in him. So what does that hope look like? He goes on to say, Paul says, that may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace, he says. All joy and peace. So when he's talking about joy, what is he talking about? Because we use that word a lot. What does that word really mean when we find it in Scripture, the, the word joy? It's an inward satisfaction of our soul. 
We think joy is this cheerful, bubbly personality. No, no, and we judge it by, I think, those superficial realities of our life. But I, what I realize when I look at what God is talking to us about, it's an inward satisfaction of my soul that God satisfies me, not the things around me in life, which they're not all bad, but it's God that satisfies me. So it's an inward satisfaction of my soul. And then he couples joy with peace. He said they work together. So, so what is he talking about when he talks about peace? Oh, it's peace in my life because everything is going well within me. That's not what he's talking about. Peace is an inward settledness of my soul. Joy is an inward satisfaction of my soul. Then peace is an inward settledness of my soul. That my soul is at rest in God. That, that's not something I can do on my own. No, that's why this is a work of the Spirit within our life. This is a sovereign work of God within our life. He's not talking about personalities when he's talking about joy and peace. He's not talking about, and you all know this person, right? This bubbly, cheerful, um, extroverted personality who just loves to be around people. We all know that. Our peace is not that person he's not talking about who is calm and who is always collected in certain situations. And I think what you do, because sometimes you can't line up with those personalities, you say that I don't have joy, I don't have peace. It's not your personality. It's an inward satisfaction of your soul. It's an inward steadiness of your soul. It's a work of God within our lives. He says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. That's the way it works, in believing. We have talked, man, weeks from the book of Romans. We have talked about righteousness within our lives. We went back to what Paul uses as an example of Abraham. And it says that righteousness was counted to Abraham because he believed. And so what I realize is this, that joy and the peace through hope in our life comes in believing. It's about trusting. It's about confidence. It's about faith in the one who is sent to redeem us and to reconcile us is what it says. It's simply saying that I trust God in this situation. I may not be able to manage it. I may not be able to change it at all. But even outside of all of that, I can still have this inward satisfaction in my soul. I can have this inward steadiness of my soul in my life. Why? Because I'm believing that God is the source of hope in my life. And then he says, so, by, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. He said, here's the why behind the what. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit that God bookends this one text with a God of hope is longing for us to abound in hope. It's so powerful. How does it happen? It's a work of God, a sovereign work of God when I trust him. It's when I trust him. It's the Holy Spirit working within my life to bring an inward satisfaction, to bring an inward steadiness of, of my life and bring peace in my life. And those things bring hope within me. So I go back to Romans chapter 15 for a moment because I have to give you that verse 13 in context. So I read it in context with verse 12, and we tie all this together with these last two verses. Romans 15 verse 12 says this, and again Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, and him with the Gentiles hope. I stop for a point of context for you for a moment before we read verse 13 again. Because what Paul is doing, he's quoting the book of Isaiah. He's giving us, he's laying on us some Old Testament stuff is what he's doing. And he's quoting from Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1. No need to turn there, but I will read it for you. Because here's what it says. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from the roots shall bear fruit. I, I read that again because I think it's powerful. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And then he says, verse 13, as we read before, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. And, and I thought about this, a stump. A stump is the former place that a tree once resided, right? And, and from a stump comes nothing. 
From a stump comes nothing. It, it actually appears to, it, it's a sign that it's dead. It's gone. That there's not going to be a tree there where there once was a tree. And when I read that, I thought, what a powerful word image that it's been given to you and I, both from that of Isaiah and also from that of, of Romans and Paul. Because when I read this, he uses the name Jesse. And, and when I hear this, what I understand is Jesse, Jesse is a Bethlehemite. And so what that means is Jesse is from Bethlehem. And so Jesse the Bethlehemite that this scripture talks about, he's the father of a guy by the name of David. King David is what, who he is. And when I read the Advent narrative, I'm reminded that Joseph, who is of the line and the lineage and the family of David, takes his wife Mary They travel to a town called Bethlehem for a census. Why? Because Joseph is a Bethlehemite, just as Jesse was a Bethlehemite. And from Jesse, a line that seemed to be totally devastated because of invading hordes in the Old Testament, it seemed that His line and lineage and his family was dead. But God specializes in bringing dead things to life. And from Jesse comes David. And from David comes Joseph. And from Mary comes the Savior of all mankind. God takes what appeared to be dead and from that causes a shoot to come forth which is David and from that shoot comes a branch which is Jesus. In the middle of devastation in the middle of struggle in the middle of what appears to be dead there is hope. Take that for a moment and just lay that over your life. Take that for a moment and lay that over our culture. Take that for a moment and just lay that over the nightly news or the social media outlets that you read. Because hope is a baby born in a cave, wrapped in rags, Desperate to keep that little baby warm, his mother places him in a feed bin. In a cave, in a town where more people move away than ever move in. That Joseph travels to his hometown and hope is forged in the moments of hopelessness. So what are you saying, Martin? I'm saying to you this morning, don't give up. In the bleakest moments of life, hope comes. Because that's the Advent story. That's where we start. And hope is an anchor. It may look dead, but God specializes in bringing life. Trust him, lean into him. Because here is the thought. Your rough place in life is an opportunity for hope. Realize that. Your rough place in life is an opportunity for hope. But Mark, nothing can hold my hope. I go back to the sponge here. Nothing can hold my hope. I've tried it so many times with so many people in, in, in so many places and nothing can hold my hope. And here's what God is saying to you through the Advent story. Who's God is saying to you from the book of Romans, from Paul. He's saying, God is saying, I have this. Trust me. I have it. That he is a God of hope. Not just that he's going to give you a little bit of hope, but yet that he is the very essence of hope itself. 
so I think this morning for many of us today that it's time for us to redeem our hope. For us to maybe take some time later today to get away, get alone, and identify the misplaced hopes of our lives and surrender those things to God. God, it is impossible for him to lie. That's such a powerful thought, isn't it? And on that, we have an anchor. So it doesn't matter what's happening around us. And yes, we are conscious of that and we're caring in those areas. We're compassionate about the things that go on around us. Absolutely. We live in this culture and we make Christ known. But in the middle of hopelessness, in the middle of your diminished hope this morning, there's being forged a greater hope in your life through Christ. So for a moment, would you bow your heads with me for a moment of reflection to cut out all the distractions, those of you that are here in person, those of you that are joining us from church at home, could you just bow your heads for a moment with us? Kind of, you know, maybe turn off all the distractions around you in your home today And just for a moment, trust God. So, Father, you are our hope in life. That, God, you have blessed us with people around us that we do have hope in. You have blessed us with jobs and other things in life that we do place our hope in at times. But, God, the reality is that you are our ultimate hope. Because you cannot lie. And so our hope is based on promises that you have made to us. And in that we have a sure anchor in this life. Lord, you know where we are and you know who we've trusted in and you know where we've placed our hope. And and God, you've seen as those things kind of crumble in our very hands at times when we try to hold on to it all and keep it all together. And so, God, we're reminded once again, God, from your story, that in the middle of hopelessness, hope is forged because we lean into you and we trust you, Lord. So bring us great hope, Father, in this Advent season. Help us to be instruments and communicators of hope in other people's lives this Advent season. For those that are suffering today, God, that you would simply, by your spirit, fill them with hope. For people, Lord, today like like Cynthia Wilson, who is suffering in the hospital this morning, God, that you would speak hope to her life. For those that are preparing to say goodbye to loved ones and they can't be at their bedside, that, God, that you would flood their hearts and their lives and those families with hope in you. Because in a very broken world, God, you can fix us with hope. And that's where we stand. And we have an anchor in you, in your name. In your name, Father. We pray.